Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here. You know that. We can't do this without you. And it's so important that uh, we remember that indeed we are in relationship one with another. And not because we all want to be, but because God has called us to be. And in that call, there is a richness uh, that we find uh, that uh, can be found in no other way. So it is really good to be with you. It's good to, to share this time of service. Uh, I know I've met a couple uh, new people, Max I've met, and I met Linda, and, and uh, I'm Roger LeWare, I'm a uh, pastor retired uh, uh, from this congregation, uh, and uh, have the opportunity to, uh, to volunteer within this community with you and in the various things that are happening to bring goodness to life here. And so it's so good to have a chance to share and worship with you. So as we worship together, just know that this is the day that the Lord has made. It's a day of blessing. It's a day where you are called to think through your life and be renewed in spirit, to recognize that there is a power that's in our midst that is not controlled by us, but in fact is influenced by the love that we are willing to, to link with and that you and I uh, together with the community at large and churches of all brands and denominations and, and people, Catholic and Protestant, uh, Jewish and Muslim and all in this world seeking to bring peace and justice are the people of God and we celebrate that today. So it's good to be with you and I know that uh, we will have an opportunity to share in that call to worship at this time. I have the opportunity to bring to you two scriptures and then, and then to think with you a little bit about these scriptures. You know, I was out fishing with my uh, first cousin and um, besides the wonderful uh, jumbo perch that we were catching, eat your heart out, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, uh, we were also talking about faith because uh, he's a a man of faith, uh, new, new in some sense to the faith, and so therefore so excited, an excitement that I wish we could find again. In every church that I visited this summer, I wish we could have found that excitement. But the excitement being that God is working in his life. And so the two scriptures that I share with you are scriptures where some other people have shared some excitement about God working in their life. And first I would share with you from Isaiah, and I would share with you this vision uh, that comes to Isaiah. And I am reading from the uh, 61st chapter of Isaiah. This is at the end, uh, when Isaiah is toward the end of the exile. They, they've been in exile, They're, they uh, have lost hope, they have been battered down early in exile, they would have said to you, how do we sing the Lord's song in a new land? In anguish they would have said that. But now we're toward the end of that. They've kind of got grooved into what was happening in life, the not liking it, wishing for their homeland. And then Isaiah brings to them a vision of who they can be. And, and what I like about this is the vision is for you and for me as well. This is who we can be. It says, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. That's in the eighth verse of this chapter. So there's, that gives you kind of the opposite of what God is looking for. But there's, and there's a vision that will define that for us. And here is what God is looking for. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Could you feel that again? You know, could you and I feel that again? The spirit of the Lord being upon us? It's true. It's a truth. We know that in the United Church of Christ. Because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. And that's not just prisoners who are behind iron bars. That's anyone who is imprisoned in their own anxieties and in the own trapment of the world. Release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display God's glory. Woo! Did you hear it? That, you know, for some people, that could even get your heart moving a little faster. The Spirit of the Lord is born. Now, Isaiah was not the only one that knew that. In fact, I could go any place in here. But I chose to go to Luke because I thought this one was familiar to you. Now, remember, as Isaiah was writing in about, uh, this would have been about, to 900, somewhere 1,900, uh, uh, they'd be after David, so it would probably be more like the 900s, okay? Nine, maybe eight, eight, nine hundred, you have to count backwards. But Luke is being written in the first century. We're talking almost a thousand years later. And here's, here's a man, like you and me, or woman, like you. knew the spirit and heard these words Jesus spoke these words but heard these words the spirit of the Lord is upon me there it is again isn't it because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor this is a thousand years later he's still anointing us do you think he could be anointing us today it's a thousand years later here between these two. What about today? Anointing us to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll. This is Jesus rolling up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all were upon him. And he said, today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. God, May the Lord renew you, renew me in the hearing of these words. I want to thank you for uh, letting me share in leadership and worship again with you. Uh, this is something that's dear to my heart, as you are dear to my heart. This is uh, an opportunity that I don't want to squander, and I don't want to take lightly. For I know that if you and I could hear the word, I mean, we could really hear it. And it would make more noise in our life than the noise of the world around us. If the word of the Lord would make more noise in our life than the noise around us, and all of the, all of the scheduling and all of the pressures and all of the anxieties and all of the, of the demands, and, and even within ourselves, all of our entitlements would go silent and we could hear the word of the Lord, I believe we would be a different church in this world. I really do believe that. I believe that God is moving in the midst of you, your life and in the midst of my life. I know he's moving in the midst of my life or she. I haven't quite figured that out, what that all is yet. 
But I know there is a movement of the Spirit that's within my life. Not that I like it. i got to tell you that. Uh, I believe that I'm called to be doing some things in this community. And sometimes I'd rather be out fishing, quite frankly. Um, and uh, yet, and you know, bow hunting is coming in, you know, and I'm looking at October and and I'm looking at both what I believe to be the call that God has given to me uh, in family and in community. And I know that, that there is something moving within the life that you and I know, whatever that life translates into being. And so these passages that I chose as I was reading Scripture were because of that, okay? And I, I have been had the opportunity this summer to be in many churches and to, to, to do supply like I'm doing now, to share with congregations, some I've been to before, others I have not. And I want to tell you that I'm somewhat saddened by what I see as I look back on those other churches that I've, that I've visited. Because I'm noticing that there's not a lot of passion. Not a lot of excitement. Sometimes not even a lot of joy. And I think that's a shame because my faith is fun. I know my faith. And it's fun. I, I, I see a God that laughs and moves and and. And enjoy. I see a God that has faith in me. And I think there's, that God has faith in you also. That expects some things out of you and me. You see? That's what I mean by having faith. He wouldn't challenge me if he didn't have faith. And I use he only in a pejorative sense. I, you know, but the point is that this is not about our comfort, I'm beginning to understand. It's not about our comfort. It's not about being a club. It's not about just coming together and uh, for the sake of coming together. It's not about maintenance or keeping something because we happen to have it. It's about faith. And it's about the power of God. It's about the power of God that Luke is talking about. It's the power of God that Isaiah is talking about. And it's the power of God that I can turn any place in the scripture and I can find that power of God speaking to me. I can find it speaking to me if I turn, say I, I'll turn into one of the, the, uh, the epistles back here. And what I am saying, brothers and sisters, that blood cannot inherit the kingdom it's an inheritance by the spirit. So it's not about the bodily or the physical. It's about the spiritual that makes us. It's not about how we look. It's not about how much money we have. It's not about where we live. It's about how we translate God's faith in us into what we do in this world and what we do for each other. I mean, that's becoming really clear to me. It's not even about the brand of Christianity or anything else that you and I live. It's about our lives. And so that passion is missing in our churches. It was missing in churches in centuries <coughs> before. And yet God somehow brings a renewing spirit to us. If we can but here. Now, I'm not saying that I'm going to be speaking what you want to hear. I don't know that. In fact, I, I remember a story, in fact, about uh, a great preacher who was, who was circulating around the country and uh, was really in demand to preach and, and, and was trying to be uh, uh, true to the word, and he was up preaching like crazy, and a man clear back in the back because this guy commanded large audiences and so that a person clear back by the back door maybe even out in that by the rock out there stood up and waving his hand like crazy and says hey i can't hear you i can't understand what you're trying to tell us and just as quick a 
person in the front seat stands up and says, well, I can hear him and understand him, and I'd like to trade places with that guy. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that's not the case for you. I'm hoping there's a power to what you hear today that will enable you to find that passion. Again, wasn't there a passion when you first met Christ? Wasn't there a passion when you first thought about God working in your world? Yes, there was. And there was a passion for Jesus. If we turn to Mark, for example, in Mark's gospel, we read, and I, quote, I, I wrote it down here, the time is fulfilled. This is the vision that Jesus brought. This is the vision that empowered Jesus, this great, this Jesus who knew God who was a spiritual mystic, this Jesus who knew such power that he could not contain himself. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand or has come near is another translation. Repent and believe in the good news, the gospel. What makes it hard for us to hear this is that we are, that have been misled I think for far too long. You and I have been misled by we have paid more attention to the second, third, and fourth century of the development of Christianity than we have paid attention to Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. We have even read Jesus through Paul rather than Paul through Jesus. That's not helpful. We need to know this Jesus and in knowing this Jesus, then we need to come to this word and begin to understand that God is moving in your midst with a dynamic and powerful calling for you. God has faith in you. God has faith in each one of you to fulfill a calling that is yours. Is yours. It's uniquely yours. Now, there are some others who may have similar and join with you. But God has faith in you. And that's important that you never forget that. And so God says to you, repent. Now, that may make your blood boil a little bit. Because you've heard repent, but that's only because we have heard it in the misinformation that we've received. Second, third, fourth century Christianity. We know the six lines that are, are hard for us. It's, it's around us all the time. The six lines that I'm talking about is that perfection, line one, the fall, condemnation, salvation, heavenly perfection, or eternal hell. Those are the six lines that, you know, I'm just summarizing. The, the, you know the story on those lines, right? I mean, you can put it together yourself. I need a head shake here. You're still with me. Okay, okay. All right, I just want to make sure I got half of you still with me, okay? So that's, that, I guess that's not too bad. If I were in baseball, that would be batting 500, so I guess that's okay. All right, but the point is that because of those six lines, because we have translated this understanding of Jesus to be somehow people who are condemned by birth, original sin, condemned by birth, that somehow we are not acceptable until we repent in a way that says I've got to, it's like I'm a, a, a sinaholic, I've got to acknowledge all of my corruptions and all of my I'm a piece of crap. That's not true, okay? You got to know that. You see, the power that Jesus didn't know these six lines. I got to tell you, there's nowhere in the teachings of Jesus that you'll know these six lines because they're not there. They have been added in, and scholars help us to see that. They've been added in. And so when Jesus said repent, what did Jesus mean? Because he did say repent. And it's a beautiful thing. He said repent. 
means to transform your mind. If you look at the Greek that Jesus used, the language that Jesus spoke, as close as we could get it, Jesus actually spoke Aramaic, but Greek is as close as we can get. You realize the translation of repent means a changing of mind and spirit. It's like Paul. Now I can read Paul through Jesus, and Paul says that the transformed through the renewing of your mind. See, Paul knew. I think Paul was trying to walk between Jesus and Judaism. You see. But he knew the power of Jesus, as I'm hoping we will continue to know the power of Jesus. And so renewal of our minds. That we would look at our life differently. That's what that means. That's what You look at your life right now. You can't just keep going the way you're going. We can't do that. I can't just keep going the way I'm going. Some people say, I don't know how to retire yet. I haven't, re I haven't learned retirement. Well, I'm starting to find out that retirement is different than I thought it was because the call of God does not go away just because I retired And I'm so glad God's a fisherman. But anyway, <laughs> the point is it's a transforming of my mind now. I need, there's a lot that I need to balance in my life. There's a lot that you need to balance in your life. We know the, we know the struggle of the balancing, don't we? We live it every day. Things happen. Difficult things happen. And yet, God has faith in us. I love it. God has faith in us. And I think God's disappointment must be very real at times when we drop the ball or we give up on God. God never gives up on us. I got to tell you that. Never gives up on us. And I want to tell you, it is about the spirit. There is a spirit power that you can tra be transformed within. And that spirit power comes to you in repent, transforming of the mind. You see. So if the kingdom of God is today, and it is, Jesus says it is today. Luke quotes Jesus. It is today. Isaiah found out it is today. And it is today for you too, and for me too, that the kingdom of God is present. Calling us to be transformed in our mind, in the way we think, and how we use our life. You see, that's the struggle. How are we going to use our life? Servant seems to be a handle that I can get a hold of. Now, you have to find your handle. But you've got to get a hold of a handle that, for you, allows you to live within the kingdom of God that is not something about, I die and go to heaven. The kingdom of God is now. It's here. It's present. Martin Luther King drew on that same thing when he, when he talked about the ark that leads to justice and peace that, is, that we can link into. And that ark is alive and we're moving within the world. A lot of people are beginning to understand that throughout the world. Now we still have challenges. Don't get me wrong. I know that. But the challenges don't need to be an excuse for not living the power that we know we've got. And doing it wherever we are. Okay? That's what it seems like to me. And I love this quote that, that I read in, the, in a book called, out of McLaren called A New Christianity. And, and in this quote, he's talking about our life. We can't go on living as if our life is just for us. That's, 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 the, that's a, the, the, the grain right there. We can't just go on, or that it's the majority for us. That's the other piece that we do. Someday we'll feed the hungry. Someday we'll clothe the naked. Someday we'll bring justice. Someday we'll be able to come to our enemies and treat them as a neighbor and, and let the, 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 the weapons that we use be the weapons of kindness. Instead of the sharp knives and the, and the big guns and the bombs. We, it's possible. This is a possibility, you see. Not because you and I are so intelligent, but because the Spirit 
is alive and God has faith in us. That's why it can happen. Healing happens because God has faith in us. And that's why prayer is so real and so powerful. And there's a whole thing I'd love to share with you about that, but that another day. But hear this quote. To accept the free gift of being born into the life of the ages, life abundant. And that's what the kingdom of God is defined as by this author. Life abundant. That's what, and I like that. That's what God is inviting us into. That's why if you transform your mind, transform your mind, you'll find that abundance has a lot of ramifications. It's kind of like one of those toys I used to have. I forget the name of the thing. I was trying to rack my brain. I can't come up with it. You'll know what it is. It's one of those you look through, and when you turn it, you get a, a tapestry that always is changing. Kaleidoscope. Thank you. Kaleidoscope. That was a wonderful toy. It gave a vision of what God is drawing us into, you see. Life abundant, participating in the new genesis, the new creation that interrupts the downward spiral of violence and counter-violence interrupts that, allowing you and me to join in upward regenerative movements and processes. Upward as opposed to down. You see, one of the things about the fall, once you fell from perfection, when, I mean, when you were at perfection, you only, only had one direction to go. That's all you had. So you either live perfection, which would mean you were God, or whoop, downward spiral. And somebody then's got to pay the price. You see, that whole theology, that whole theology has misled us. And we, we lose the sense of God's grace and promise when we go to that theology. And unfortunately, all of us still carry a piece of that theology with us. I mean, all of us, including me. I was raised on that stuff. We all carry that with us, you see. So there is some fear, too much fear, actually, that is connected to our faith. For us to really step out, we have to deal with that fear. And we can do it together, we can do it. But this fear, what if, what if, that's what the fear that's one of the Sunday suits that the fear wears. What if? But we can be a part of a regenerative movement and process. We can experience a new exodus because it's happening already. We are passing through the waters leading to liberation and new vision. Only the waters we're passing through are the waters of baptism. That's the waters we're passing through now. The new exodus, the new creation comes to us through the waters of baptism. And we are fed the, the Passover meal. The manna in the wilderness is now the Eucharist and communion that you and I can share so that we can be fed and, and remember that it is God who has faith in us. And the new kingdom anticipated by the prophets, inaugurated in Christ, a kingdom in which we are learning to be God's disciples with love, lived in word and in deed. Wow. Is that not a vision of the kingdom of God that you could take home with you? Maybe you could even text, blog, whatever you do to your friends and say, hey, I'm beginning to find that the kingdom of God is different than what I've heard before. And the power of it is still within this very word of God. I pray that today you will know that Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. No, no. Think about that now. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. 
that is better than all of the other religions. And you and I have named that, well, it was named in the third century Christianity. Jesus didn't come. You see, Jesus didn't even know that word that came in about the third century. But Jesus did. You see, he came to announce that the kingdom of God is about forgiveness, about enemies becoming neighbors, about sharing bread with the hungry, giving clothes to those who are ragged, inviting the stranger, yes, now listen, inviting the stranger into our own home that our homes would not become places that allow us to retreat from the world, but our homes would become places where we encounter the very love and share that love. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion to replace Judaism and then all other religions. No, that's not it. Jesus came to announce a new kingdom, a new way of life, a new way of peace that carried the good news to all people of every religion. And a new kingdom is bigger than a new religion and it is big enough to include all religions and people of all manner of faith. And so we say, no matter where you are on life's journey, no matter where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. Let it be so.